Hi there, this is Christian, and today we're going to talk about Sappho. You've likely heard of Sappho, or even the adjective sapphic, in reference to lesbianism and maybe even great poetry. And we're going to unpack how some of those things came about. We're going to focus on ideas of poetry, community, and especially eros to pick up on some conversations that exist between Sappho's text and Plato's Symposium, even though Sappho is an easy 150 years before that text, and especially, well, especially when it's written down, and even when the conversation happens. Here are a few images of Sappho to give you a sense of uh, maybe in the late 19th century, how she was imagined next to a vase painting from 510 BCE. Uh, you'll notice the two images on the left, both are by men, Francis Coates Jones in 1895 and Charles Mangan in 1877. And then the vase painting was most likely also made by a potter, an artisan, uh, even likely a slave. One thing all of these have in common though, besides having a female uh, figure is She's holding a lyre. And uh, right, so there you have it, down there and here. And this is the keen association between Sappho and what's called lyric poetry, which is a highly formalized style of poetry. So you'll recall when I talked about sympotic. Uh, culture for the symposium, how it's an elite form of behavior, it's highly ritualized. In the same way, Sappho's writing a highly ritualized, highly formal type of poetry. You get a hint as to some of the elements of what Sappho's poetry deals with when you see here that she's performing for two women. Uh, this is a community of women that we'll discuss in a bit. Uh, notice as well, she's wearing a laurel wreath crown to uh, Garland to uh, signify her excellence. So there she's brightly lit in this community in a formal setting. Notice the architectural feature behind them where you have this interaction between nature and culture. Compare that to Sappho here where she's resting on the rock, right? So we can compare the idea of the architectural unit in the first painting to the rock formation in the second. The second image shows a Sappho with a dark background. Uh, she's looking down, almost glowering at the audience um, with her breasts bared, emphasizing the femininity. Uh, maybe a more retributive or even a rejecting of, of the reader type view. And then in the third one, she's standing forward uh, and you can see her name there. So these are three very common images. I, I, they might all even be from Wikipedia that I grabbed. So just to give you a sense that she exists in the cultural zeitgeist um, as this female figure with a lyre. However, she has another really amazing pop culture appearance. So here in um, July of 1962 uh, in Wonder Woman 131, she appears. And this is as an explanation of why Wonder Woman cries out, suffering Sappho as her exclamation. So in this image, you see um, this explanation happen in the, in the top there. Sappho was so sensitive, she couldn't stand the sight of suffering in any form. First panel. That poor suffering flower is getting sunburned. Please put a shade over it. Second. Those poor suffering fish are getting exhausted, trying to leap upstream. Carry them up. And then the third. Poor suffering cub, I will feed you until your mother is better. So one thing this does is kind of misrepresent Sappho's suffering, because as we're going to see, the reason she suffers is from an enormous amount of um, emotional sorrow having to do with Eros. However, she's going to use metaphors of nature in order to think about this. So the panel, this, this comic strip, does a really amazing job of actually representing Sappho to us, but stripping her of the erotic context, which is one of the ways that Sappho's been treated over the years. So 
Um, just thought you might enjoy seeing that. Uh, I'm Wonder Woman's in the zeitgeist right now. So we're going to be focusing on Sappho almost as an erotic philosopher through her poetry. Maximus of Tyre, in his 18th oration, has a line that gets quoted frequently. Ton erota Socrates, sophistein lege. Sappho muthoplokon. Socrates calls eros sophos. Sappho calls eros myth weaver. After this, he then quotes um, Sappho 47, which we're going to look at in a second, and we actually already have looked at, um, although they seem to be unrelated because that poem doesn't actually use this term, muthoplokon. So we've already looked at um, a little bit how Plato writes Socrates talking about eros, and it actually isn't in the symposium that we get this quite uh, exact version, but you'll note what's important here is um, Socrates knows things about eros, and he connects eros to that verb erotao that we talked about, meaning to ask questions, so those two things that um, got connected. And what a sophist does is it kind of um, provides elaborate descriptions. Um, although a sophist is quite different than Socrates, so there's, there's, a, there's a really interesting thing culturally happening there. But what's set into strong contrast is Sappho, Sappho calls Eros a myth weaver. Muthos is myth, and a plokon is somebody that weaves, all right? So a textile weaver. So Sappho is essentially saying, oh, Eros is a person that creates narrative. And in this way, that's consistent with what um, the symposium was presenting, that Eros drives people to become pregnant with ideas that makes them want to create speeches or art or paintings, et cetera, music. All right. So taking, for example, the Ann Carson, if not winter edition, which is beautifully um, presented as an art object, one thing I want to examine is why does it look like this when we open the pages? So you'll see on the left-hand side that you have the Greek words, but then you get what are called square brackets. And what that's representing is that the source from where these texts come from is missing. So these texts are highly fragmented, and Anne Carson imitates that by telling us and then filling in the spaces. But why does it look like this? When we were reading um, Plato, it didn't look like this, and later when we read the Odyssey, it's not going to look like this. Well, it's because of how Sappho was transmitted, and a huge part of the Sapphic corpus that we have came from a trash heap called Oxyrhynchus. Oxyrhynchus is here in Egypt, and it was the trash heap of a very um, thriving settlement called the Fayum. Uh, in the middle image, you can see from the late eight, 19th and uh, early 20th century, the excavation of Sappho that's happening there. And then uh, on the far right, you see a text that's been um, cleaned up. Um, texts of Sappho also come from cartonnage which is mummy wrappings that you would take. And so people were desperate in the 19th century to uh, find texts from antiquity. And so they just ripped these things off of a huge, huge number of mummies. Early archeology span had no concern with really like Egyptian culture. It was so um, desperate to find Greek texts. Um, if you look around a little bit, there's actually a drama that's happening in the contemporary society because uh, recently in 2015, a fellow named um, Dirk Obrink came along and said, hey, I found these two new Sapphos. Um, and then there's an elaborate story around them. It's likely they are real, but it's also likely that there's no provenance, right? He's not telling anybody where he got them, which means that they are illegally transmitted. So another place that these come from are later grammarians. And grammarians were people that were writing um, about grammar and especially like Greek word usage. That Because so ancient Greek uh, is a language that lasts for a really long time. But at some point, people stop being able to understand how it used to be used. And so they sit around and they write great dictionaries of words and usage. One such fellow is Pollux. And he writes about this word 
uh, the reason we have this Sappho fragment 191 is because he said, um, oh, Anacreon says he garlands himself with Myrtle, also with Annas, as does Sappho and Alcius. These two, Sappho and Alcius, or Alcaeus, however you want to say it, um, these two also mention celery. And because this grammarian said Sappho said the word celery, we then have this nice fragment that happens. And the reason those words look differently is because uh, the grammarian is using the plural to say that they both mention it. So, or it's in a different grammatical form. Um, right, so that's primarily how these things come down, right? We don't have a book of Sappho that comes down. And so these numbers that get attached to it also are just according to custom, the order in which things were published. Right. The other issue that comes up with reading Sappho is how to approach the fragment. Right. There's kind of three different ideas that I want to present. The first is despair. Right. You look at these and you're like, there's no way we can say anything about it. It's helpless. We, we can't do anything. The second is creative. Oh, well, uh, I can try to fill in and guess what's there and use it as a starting off point for my own poetic creation and competition. The third is hope. This idea that um, maybe we'll find something, right? So ask yourselves when you are at a cliff and you're looking into the abyss, do you see that as a source of hope and potential? Or do you see it as the abyss of despair? And this is what it's like to kind of look at a fragment of Sappho. Largely though, uh, in this, I'm gonna talk about uh, the confrontation with the isolated word and fragment and how it really can just devastate. So let's return to Sappho 47, which is a poem that I discussed several weeks ago. Eros de Tinaxemoi Frenas. Os animos cat oros druxen empeton. Eros shook my mind like a mountain wind falling on oak trees. Uh, here you'll remember the ideas that we had from the Wonder Woman comic where, oh, we, we might think Sappho's thinking, oh, the oak trees, they're suffering. We need to do something about the mountain wind that's falling on them. Um, but that's not what's actually happening, but we are using the nature metaphor that the um, Wonder Woman comic understood it was there although it's stripped the erotic. Here though, we're gonna confront the erotic. So we start with the oak trees and the mountain wind is falling on them. What uh, Sappho's doing though, is she's using this as a simile, which means Eros is like the mountain wind. And so Sappho's mind is like the oak tree. In this way, Eros at first seems to have control, but as I mentioned, this is a text, which means it's written down. And so Sappho is actually the person that has control and her control comes from regaining control of her mind, her phrenos. Look at that emphatic position in the second line there. This has to do with these, these shifts that we have, right? If you express your emotions in highly formalized poetry, does that mean you're distant from your emotion or you're concentrated more on your emotion? These are really exciting questions that you can be asking yourselves and thinking about whenever you encounter a work of art that has to do with the emotions. Let's turn now to one of the most famous um, poems of Aphrodite because it's one of the most complete, maybe even the only complete. This is Sappho 1. On the image of the, on the left there, what you have is Terra who is Willow's girlfriend in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And in a dream sequence in the final episode of season four entitled Restless, Willow calligraphies this poem onto the back of her girlfriend. Very interesting, very sensual moment. Here's the poem. Deathless Aphrodite of the spangled mind, child of Zeus who twists, lures, I beg you, do not break with hard pains, O oh lady, my heart, but come here, if ever before you caught my voice far off, and listening left your father's golden house and came yoking your car, and fine birds brought you quick sparrows over the black earth, whipping their wings down the sky through midair. They arrived, 
But you, O oh blessed one, smiled in your deathless face and asked, now again, I have suffered. And why, now again, I am calling out. And what I want to happen most of all in my crazy heart. Whom should I persuade, now again, to lead you back into her love? Who, O oh Sappho, is wronging you? Or, if she flees, soon she will pursue. If she refuses gifts, rather she will give them. If she does not love, soon she will love, even unwilling. Come to me now. Loose me from hard care and all my heart longs to accomplish. Accomplish. You. Be my ally. The reason I've called this a prayer is because it has the formal elements of a prayer. Uh, Sappho uses a variety of epithets early on in order to talk about Aphrodite, right? You might think of another, any other religious tradition that you have. You don't just say, um, like, God, do this thing. Usually you would, God or goddess, you would provide a system of honorary epithets to kind of give the figure more honor. Right away, though, we're treating Aphrodite's mind, right? Remember how uh, Sappho was talking about her own phrenes earlier? Well, this is an intellectual project. She needs Aphrodite's wiles, her, her trickery, her intellectual capability, not just her brute force or her overwhelming charisma. And here we get some interesting words about that, right? Like twisting and luring. Um, mental twisting is a common trope. It's associated as well with Odysseus later on that we'll see in the Odyssey, Polytropos. Um, many twists and turns, many turnings. A lure, right? Um, to lure somebody in, to lay a trap for them. And then Aphrodite, Sappho says, I beg you. So this is the formal invocation of Aphrodite, and what follows is the request. And Aphrodite, uh, Sappho says, do not break my heart. Right? You have the power, Aphrodite, not to break my heart. I hope you will not do it. And so she asks, hey, come here, if ever before you caught my voice far off. And now, so here we have the, the prayer and invocation. And now what we're gonna get is the um, contract between a God and a human, right? If ever you heard me pray, you do this thing now, right? I'm not asking you just for one time. I have a relationship with you where I continually call upon you and you answer and says, hey, like if you heard another thing, come to me if you've ever been here before. Um, the reason it says yoking your car is because it's a, it's a chariot type structure. So the birds, the sparrows are pulling it. And so that's why it's yoke because the yoke is the thing that goes over your neck, usually the cows, but here we're yoking um, sparrows. And it's coming over the black earth from the sky, right? Because it's coming from Olympus. There, um, but you, oh blessed, one smiled in your deathless face and asked, right? So now we switch to Aph talking, Aphrodite talking. And she says, what? Now again, I have suffered. And why? Now again, I am calling. All right. So though what I want to emphasize is the now again. So Sappho struck, struggles with a consistency of falling in love and having her heart broken. And Aphrodite knows this. They have this almost casual relationship with it. Then Aphrodite says, what does she want to happen in her crazy heart? Now we get some of the most important things that we can have. Because we have, whom should I persuade now again to um, lead you back into her love? Whom should I persuade now again to lead you back into her love. So, what's the most important word there? Well, you might think it's one of these strong words, like persuade, or lead, or love, but it's actually this tiny, 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 little possessive adjective, her, which um, the Greek for this is son. Uh, tiny little word. And what we find here? Well, the poet is Sappho, because we also get her named. 
So this makes it very clear that this is a relationship between two women. There's no reading around that at this point. And this is one of the reasons why Sappho is a great queer icon for readers. I'm going to say queer rather than strictly lesbian because other texts that we read will show her saying that she loves men. And I'm not going to say bisexual because I don't want to apply uh, a term that I'm on, I can't actually say with authority about Sappho. So queer is a kind of very um, solid word to use that will give us the um, array of meaning that we need in order to understand Sappho's descriptions of uh, sex and desire, eros, essentially. So if somebody is breaking Sappho's heart, here's where we start getting some um, specific language. Who's wronging you? So now Sappho is in the wrong and the person that doesn't love her causes the harm. And here's the promise that comes from the contract. If she flees, soon she will pursue. If she refuses gifts, rather she will give them. If she does not love, soon she will rub, right? So what we have here is a reversal. And then in an amazing moment, that's going to be hugely controversial, we end the stanza, even unwilling. Even unwilling. Well, this raises the idea of agency. Sappho is making this prayer to Aphrodite and Aphrodite promises, you know what, I'm going to do this contract and I can force her to love you. I can strip her of her own choice and make her love you. Think about this in contrast to something like the Aristophanic love that we were looking at in terms of the soulmate, where each person that's been split from the other body is searching constantly for them because they each want the same person. Here we have an unequal relationship that's set up in this first poem. And then we end with Sappho's words. Come to me now, loose me from my hard care and all my heart longs to accomplish, accomplish. So she's saying, you know what, Aphrodite? Let's do it. Let's do this thing. You be my ally. An ally here is a weak translation of the noun or adjective sumakos. Sumakos means uh, to fight with. Sappho ends this poem by saying, fight with me, be my fellow battler. And in doing this, she has taken the masculine martial field of like warriors on a battlefield to the issue of her heart. She's like, Aphrodite, love is a battlefield and we're going to win no matter the cost. And the cost here is the other person's agency. Um, obviously, you might think I'm overreading this, and you can put a little bit less pressure on that ever unwilling, and it's more like, hey, we're going to persuade her, and then she's going to become willing. That's absolutely fine. I'm trying to read this in as strong a way as possible. Um, so, Sappho 16, let's jump to this. This is a very famous poem, and it's because of its structure as well as what it says. It's um, structured on a preamel. What a preamel is, is there's a series of options that are offered as alternatives, and then they're all rejected in favor of uh, the superior option. So, some, say, some men say an army of horses, and some men say an army on foot, and some men say an army of ships is the most beautiful thing on the black earth. But I say, it is what you love. Easy to make this understood by all, for she who overcame everyone in beauty, Helen, left her fine husband behind and went sailing to Troy. Not for her children, nor her dear parents, had she a thought, no, let her astray, or lightly reminded me now of Anactoria who was gone. I would rather see her lovely step and the motions of light on her face than chariots of Lydians or ranks of foot soldiers in arms. Not possible to happen. I pray for a share. Ward. Out of the unexpected. Okay, so here's how it begins, right? Um, some men say this thing, armies, um, armies and armies. Uh, so we have the cavalry, the infantry, and the navy. And so Sappho's saying, some men say this thing, but I say it's the sight of the one you love. So this connects directly with that idea of the playing with the martial metaphor with sumakos and Sappho one. Then Sappho is going to use her brain and she's going to give us a myth. She's going to use myth 
to prove her assertion, right? Very philosophical, like I'm making this assertion, here is my evidence. And her evidence is that the most beautiful woman in all of mythology, Helen of Troy, who was actually a Sparta, but a whole other thing, left her husband and left her child, left her parents in order to follow beauty and love of Paris. We then lose a significant amount of this poem before Sappho makes it about herself, right? So she starts with herself, this assertion, hey, I say it's what you love. Then she moves into mythological exemplarity to underscore her point, and then she makes it about herself. So she, it's kind of these, these three parts. One last thing to say here about the chariots of Lydians is um, why Lydia? Well, this is a strong flavor of Orientalism. So you'll see Lydia there with its capital of Sardis uh, in modern day Turkey, in Greek literature, things that come from the East right there. Lydia, the Persian Empire, are exotic and expensive. And so she's saying, you know what, even these exotic things, I don't care for these expensive things. The reason I say it's Orientalist, and this is a moment of Orientalism, is because this is when, from a Western perspective, you other another place. All right, let's compare, though, how Sappho can operate in multiple spheres. Because if we take Sappho 132, she says, I have a beautiful child who is like golden flowers in form, darling place, in exchange for whom I would not all Lydia or lovely at something, right? So she just said, I would rather see um, my girlfriend's lovely step than these chariots of Lydians. And now she's saying, oh, um, I would want to see uh, my, my own child. Well, that also contrasts because what did Helen do? Helen left behind her children. And now Sappho's saying, I wouldn't. So how do you read this? Is this biographical? So Sappho as a younger person uh, has all of these extreme feelings and then she matures and then we have this poem. Or is she capable of writing two things at one time? I'm going to be arguing that the, it's a stronger reading to say she can hold two contrasting ideas in her head at the same time. Here's an instance of great beauty in the fragmented form with Sappho 24a. You will remember, for we in our youth did these things, yes, many and beautiful things. Here we have a strong sense of the nostalgia that Sappho's poetry is tinged with. Um, when we were young, we did things and they were beautiful. This is a strong way to think about memory, especially if you watching are young yourself, know that what you're experiencing is valid and you'll look back on it and be grateful for it. And if you're older, look back and be grateful for having done those things. And know also like if you're old, you, you can still do it. Don't, don't let judgmental older Sappho version get to you. However, a big thing, one of the things I really want to emphasize is the idea of remembrance because we're gonna play with this. What's one of the ways Sappho makes sure that we remember things? She writes it down. So this is the power of the text as well. Another thing that Sappho writes quite frequently are epithalamia, and the singular is epithalamium. And what that is, it's just a wedding hymn. And this is another formal genre that exists from archaic lyric poetry. So here it's heavily fragmented, but you get a sense of it from Sappho 30. Night, girls all night long might sing of the love between you and the bride with violets in her lap. Wake! And go call the young men so that no more than the bird with piercing voice shall we sleep. So this has to do with um, various wedding cultures of a huge party and then making riotous noise as the bride and bridegroom go off. There's often a sense of uh, um, sorrow or just like really kind of a bittersweet. I shouldn't use that word because I'm going to talk about it in a second. Um, right? Because like when a woman goes to marry, she's going to leave her community that she's in in order to go to that patriarchal community. And so this might be one of the things that Sappho laments in her poems. And there's whole theories that people make out of kind of nothing of Sappho running this kind of commune for young girls, and then they occasionally leave to go get married. But 
this is a, a story that people make up out of the poetry because people are driven by a biographical drive. Those same people are deeply uncomfortable with the fragment. Here's another example of uh, the contrast between Epithalamia, right? Up with the roof, Himenaios, the god of marriage. Lift it, carpenters, Himenaios. The bridegroom is coming in, equal to Ares, Himenaios. Much bigger than a man, Himenaios. So here in 111, we have this mighty bridegroom who is compared to a warrior, right? Uh, equal to Ares, the god of war. 115. To what? Oh, beloved bridegroom, may I compare you? To a slender sapling, most of all, do I compare you? All right, so showing the playfulness of the genre. Um, these two men, obviously this is not the same poem about the same person, and if it is, that's even more exciting and funny. Uh, just showing you that Sappho has this huge range, but also a little bit of the, the sense of the uh, characteristics of the epithalamia. Now though, let's look at these tiny fragments. And in Anne Carson, this is what really kind of brutalizes your spirit if you're reading this through. With each page turn, you encounter these lines, such as kai potheo, kai maomai, I long and seek after. And we don't have the object, we just have this emotion, this bald statement of emotion. I long, kai potheo, I seek after, maomai. We then, as readers, can fill that space in with anything for ourselves because we become implicated with that first person by saying I. And we can also feel sorrow and curiosity for Sappho. But you can connect the immortality of this human emotion across the centuries. The next one is the one that chills me the most. Optais Ame. You burn me. Optas ame. So it has to do, of course, with burning an, as an emotion, right? You burn me um, because, like, you make you you make me aflamed. I burn with desire for you. But here it seems as though Sappho almost is speaking out of the page at us, the reader, saying, "I burn for you. I, I'm, my emotions are ever present for you, reader." Other ways it can be read. Um, the Sappho character, the poet, is in love with us, the reader. Or we are the ancient person to whom she's writing her poetry, telling us that she burns. Or the body of Sappho, the corpus, the Sapphic poetry, literally has burned. And we burn her. We burn the manuscripts. We burn the texts. And that's one of the ways in which she's been lost. You turn the page and you encounter Sappho 38. You're confronted I think with the enormity of human action and human emotion, all held within two words on this page. Optais ame. All right, let's switch directions a little bit here. Sappho 51. Uk oid oti theo. Duo moi. Ta noemata. I don't know what to do. Two states of mind in me. Right? Here we have this psychomachia, this battle between the, the psyche, the, 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 um, the soul that's happening. What should I do? I have option one, I have option two. Um, and later on in Rome, this will be um, exemplified in a poem by Catullus, where he'll say, Ode et amo. Ode et amo, which, uh, Ode et amo, but I hate and I love. And be like, I don't know why. I just know I do, and it so makes me suffer. So this is a great theme of poetry. This idea of like, I don't know what to do because I have these two things I want to do. Again, a deeply recognizable emotion. But as I've been trying to emphasize, when you write these things down, do you gain control of it or do you better understand it? Because notice that she says moi, me, in between duo and noemata. So the two states of mind surround her, like she's in the middle of these two things. So the, grammatically, the line imitates this action. Sappho 56. Not one girl, I think, who looks on the light of the sun will ever have wisdom like this. 
Here again, Saf was talking about a community, a relationship with a girl. But what does she celebrate here? Not so much her physical beauty as her wisdom, her Sophia. And here is a thing that really sets Sappho apart. It's not just going to be about beauty. It's about the Sophia. And this should remind you of Plato, even though, as I mentioned, Plato is later than Sappho. But this is a deeply rooted idea that somebody's wisdom is the form of beauty and attraction that you are drawn toward. So the same thing that draws you up the ladder of Diotima's ladder of love is what Sappho here is celebrating, this idea of wisdom. And notice Sappho's like, hey, women can have this too, right? A Parthenon, a young woman can have this thing. And then Sappho is going to celebrate it in highly uh, formalized poetry that shows her elite education. Well, we get part of that elite sense in Sappho 57. What country girl seduces your wits? Wearing a country dress, not knowing how to pull the cloth to her ankles. So here we have um, contemptuous Sappho looking down at a certain class of women. This fits very closely with um, the sympotic culture that we were looking at, or it's the aristocratic elite men that are gathering to talk about love. Here Sappho has contempt for the country girl who seems to have seduced the wits, right? Um, led somebody astray. She re repeats that country word twice. And then she's like, she doesn't even know how to wear her clothes, right? She doesn't know how to pull the cloth to her ankles. And to pull the cloth to your ankles has to do with issues of um, propriety, right? You don't want to show off too much skin. Uh, so let's now look at this community that Sappho seems to describe. This is a, another poem, it's quite well known, Sappho 94. I simply want to be dead. Weeping, she left me with many tears and said this. Oh, how badly things have turned out for us, Sappho. I swear against my will, I leave you. And I answered her, rejoice, go and remember me, for you know how we cherished you. But if not, I want to remind you and the beautiful times we had for many crowns of violets and roses, at my side you put on, and many woven garlands made of flowers around your soft throat. And with sweet oil, costly, you anointed yourself. And on a soft bed, delicate, you would let loose your longing. And neither any, nor any holy place, nor was there from which we were absent. No grove, no dance no sound. I mean, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous poem in and of itself. It deals with several things that uh, are commonplace. The connection between the desire to be dead because of love and um, absence, like your, your heart breaks so you want to be dead. We have she leaving me um, saying this thing. Sappho again, making sure we know that she's the subject here and that our genders are clear, right? This is when a poet doesn't want there to be an ambiguity about that. A moment of against my will. You might recall the unwilling that we had. Uh, again, I don't want to say that there's a through line narrative of poem one leads to poem 94. What I'm trying to say is you can connect these common elements and put them in dialogue with each other to try to wrestle through how a poem deals with emotion. Um, Sappho then picks up these ideas. Hey, rejoice, go and remember me. So are we to imagine that Sappho is giving this poem to the girl as well when she leaves? And so every time she reads it, it's a form of remembrance. Um, uh, here's where we get the sense of communities, where it's the idea of, for you know how we cherished you, right? Like we group of other women all loved and respected you as you now leave us to go to your marriage. I'm not saying that's what this poem is about, but that's a, a way it's been interpreted. But if not, I want to remind you, and here we have a line that starts connecting us to that earlier one. When we were young, we had these beautiful memories, and many of them. And what did they involve? Well, they involve crowns of violets and roses, um, flower garlanded crowns. This is the language of the symposium, of parties, of being young, of being elite, because things are expensive. That's the sweet oil, costly. 
right? Saying, hey, you're part of this elite culture that we're also a part of. Then you get this very interesting stanza. And on a soft bed, delicate, you would let loose your longing. This idea of letting loose is potentially about sex, in which case this would be one of the very few, even maybe the only isolated moment in Sappho's body of work that refers to sex between two women. In Aristophanes' speech, you'll recall, there was no hesitation about talking about men spilling seed into men, but there was no reference to lesbian sex, even though there was less, less um, reference to lesbians. So in this poem, we actually have a moment where we might be seeing this happen. Uh, and then it goes on, and neither any nor any holy place uh, was there from which we were absent, right? We did things all together. Um, and we were both in profane, maybe, and um, holy places together. And then there's just gorgeous ending that makes you almost think that this poem is deliberately written in this way. Because the last lines that we have are no sound. And then the poem goes quiet. Sappho 102. Sweet mother, I cannot work the loom. I am broken with longing for a boy by slender Aphrodite. All right, so lots of fun things here. First of all, we have kind of a return to um, a heterosexual narrative because it's a woman saying, hey, I love a boy. Um, so what's going on here? Well, let's start with the idea of the loom, a tone histone. Uh, a loom is the um, pinnacle, no, that's not the right word. It's the quintessential place where a woman works. She weaves tapestries. Remember what Sappho was called, what she called Eros, a muthoplocon, a myth weaver? Well, Sappho herself is a weaver of textiles. So there's this constant pun between text and textile, right? The words on the page and what you would create at a loom, um, a garment. And so uh, Sappho seems to be saying, hey, sweet mother, I can't work the loom, which might be, oh, mom, I can't like do my domestic housework. And then what's her excuse? I'm broken with longing for a boy by slender Aphrodite. All right, so a few different things you can do here. One, she's trying to get, uh, she's like, the speaker's trying to get out of work. Oh, I, I can't do any work, mom. I like, am really into heterosexuality. And I just, I just, I'm helpless. There's the excuse where she's like, hey, I can't write poems because I'm in love with a boy from Aphrodite. Whereas she doesn't suck. She's I'm very good at writing poems when she's in love with a girl. So. That might also be happening there. Uh, of course, then we also have this idea of being broken, um, connecting to her prayer to Aphrodite. Hey, like, don't break me. So all sorts of really exciting things are happening in what is kind of just two lines of simple comment, but it is kind of about domestic production, which is linked then to uh, cultural production. Let's compare this to Symposium 191C in Aristophanes' speech. When male embraced male, they would at least have the satisfaction of intercourse after which they could stop embracing, return to their jobs and look after each other, each, look after their other needs in life. So there he's saying, you know what? Something like men will get so horny that they can't concentrate on work. And so they then need to have intercourse after which no problem, they go back to work, they've done it. And so here we get this maybe sense in Sappho, it's like, man, I, I just need to have sex so that I can then concentrate on the rest of the world around me, on the needs in life and return to the job. So uh, two lines, uh, really, really great and exciting there. We'll talk a fair amount about looms and female work at the loom with Penelope later on. Uh, fun fact, a histone is literally anything that's been set up right. Uh, so a man's version of a histone is the mast in a boat. All right, two other short little poems here. Sappho 105 uh, A and B. As a sweet apple reddens on a high branch, high on the highest branch, the apple picker's forgot. No, not forgot. We're unable to reach. 105B, like a hyacinth in the mountains that shepherd men with their feet trampled down and on the ground, the purple flower. Um, so these, I don't want to say too much about them because I want really, to really let their meaning uh, and interpretation sit either unidentified and just appreciated or uh, analyzed as you might want. Do notice, though, that Sappho is using these agricultural, um, 
metaphors of nature, which again, we saw back in that Wonder Woman comic that had been completely removed from the erotic. So here, really uh, press on the erotic uh, definitions and interpretations that you have, right? These apple pickers, kind of, um, what were they unable to reach? Is an apple just an apple? Is a hyacinth just a hyacinth? Why are these men trampling them? Why is the power purple? Lots going on here. I don't want to close down interpretation, but I also don't want to offer you too much. But you should be thinking about the erotic. All right, so we talked about the epithalamia, the wedding hymns. Another type of hymn that um, exists in erotic poetry is what's called a paraclausithrone. And a paraclausithrone literally means a locked outside the door lover. And this is what I think is happening in this poem, even though we don't know for sure. The doorkeeper's feet are seven arm lengths long, five oxides for his sandals, 10 shoemakers worked on them, right? So Sappho wants to be with a person, that person's inside a house and she's like, the doorkeeper is just so big and so outstretched and I can't slide through. So here I think this is kind of fun, it's making fun of him a little bit. Um, the sandals, sandals are probably important. You'll notice there's a lot of language about sandals. Feet in poetry are always important because they refer to poetic feet. Um, so again, it's, it seems playful, but it's probably doing a lot more work. Sappho's very famous for this adjective that she seems to coin here. So, Eros, the melter of limbs, now again stirs me. Sweet, bitter, unmanageable creature who steals in. Glucopicron, Eros deuta molusimeles done. Glucopicron, amacanon. Or Peton. Really kind of um, beautiful poem here about the being helpless before Eros, right? So we have talked about how um, Aphrodite said, hey, Af uh, sorry, er Sappho said, hey, Aphrodite, help me out here. Um, make this other person kind of love me. Now she's saying, oh man, Eros has descended upon me and now I love somebody else. I can't control it. It's both sweet and it's bitter. Right, what, a, a very specific oxymoron that's here. It's awesome to be in love. It also causes me great pains and suffering to be in love. I can hold two things in my mind and in my heart at one time. And we're gonna end with Sappho 147. Someone will remember us, I say, even in another time. And this is what you've done. By reading Sappho and engaging with Sappho, you've remembered her. You've remembered the us those that she loved and the ideas that she shared. And so Sappho spoke truly when she said, Manasistai, Tinfaimi, I heteron, Amemon.